right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Navigating America's Identity Crisis, the Child Trans Movement. My name is Savannah Hernandez, and I am here with Chloe Cole and Laura Becker. All right, y'all. So what we wanted to do with this panel today was because I think everybody here knows that transition in terms of children specifically is not the best thing in the world. And so what we were wanting to do with this panel was give everybody and equip everybody in the audience today with the best ways to combat some of the most popular points you might hear in terms of why child transition surgery or child transgenderism is a good thing. So that's what we're doing today. But before we get into it, let's start with our panelists here. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Give us one minute. Chloe, tell us your story. So I am a detransitioned advocate for the rights of children, of patients, and of parents. And I went through the process. <laughs> Thank you. I went through the process of going through a medical gender transition while I was still a child between the ages of 12 to 16. I started identifying as a boy at 12 years old after years of struggling with being a tomboy, was struggling to find my own identity, of going through an early puberty, um, experiencing sexual trauma and body image issues. And at 13 years old, I was fast tracked in the process of medically transitioning, first starting with shots of Lupron to suppress my puberty and shortly afterward I was put on a weekly dose of testosterone shots and at 15 years old I underwent my first and my only surgery which was a, rad a radical double mastectomy. I realized less than a year later that in the end all I really wanted was to become a woman. All I wanted was to grow up as a girl, to become a mother and a wife one day and I wanted to have children of my own but I was afraid of my own femininity and the power that came with that. And since then, since I was since I was 17 years old, I've been speaking out on about my story, trying to prevent history from repeating itself. Incredible, incredible. Thank you so much, Chloe. And now, Laura, tell us a little bit about yourself. So my story is very similar to Chloe's, but I was diagnosed in the autism spectrum when I was 11 years old. I experienced childhood abuse as well. I had undiagnosed complex PTSD when I was a teenager and I found gender ideology online that was validated in the schools, my college. And when I was 18, I came out as a transgender man and that was validated by my therapists and my doctors. And instead of treating my trauma and my autism, they validated the lie that you could become the opposite sex or that cosmetic surgery, mutilating surgery was mental health treatment. Fortunately, I was too suicidal at the time to understand the complications and I went on testosterone at 19 and had my breasts removed from my body when I was 20. At 22, I was diagnosed with PTSD and finally understood that I was never meant to be a trans person or a man I was just a traumatized, very hurt woman and little girl. And since then, I've been working also as a patient advocate. And I'm also an author of a detransition memoir, Surviving the Trans Myth, coming out hopefully soon. Well, you're both incredible, and um, thank you so much for being here. Now, my first question, and we'll direct it at Chloe first. One of the things that I hear, especially at a lot of these pride rallies and protests, is children as young as three know their gender identity. What is your response to that? There is no such thing as being born in the wrong body. And no child, no man or woman deserves to believe that about themselves. And Laura, what do you think about that as well? Oh, sorry, Chloe, were you, were you finished with that? The idea is that by not allowing a gender dysphoric child to transition, you are forcing them to go through the wrong puberty. But puberty is a natural bodily process, and a child cannot develop and soon adults without it. You cannot fully mature physically, sexually, or psychologically into an adult if you are not allowed to go through this process. And no child is equipped 
to make decisions regarding any of that, regarding the development of their own body, and whether or not they're able to have children as adults. All right, and Laura, another thing that I might hear too on top of children as young as three might know their gender identity is if you don't allow a child to transition, they may commit suicide. This is a, a very, I would say, hard, like hard thing to hear, right? Especially if you're a parent. So if you're a parent who has a quote unquote transgender child and this is what you're hearing, how do you combat that? So the suicide myth is one of the largest myths around with the transgender issue. It almost originated the myth that there is such a thing as a transgender person or a transgender child. Uh, there are two sexes, there are infinite personalities, and there are infinite ways to suffer within the human condition as a male or a female. That doesn't mean that we need to mutilate the body in order to temporarily soothe a delusion that someone would be better off without their intact body parts. So the suicide myth is the most pervasive manipulation that doctors, therapists, well-intentioned progressive idiots use to manipulate families and spread propaganda about this pseudoscience. So my response to that is we don't have data on the suicide rates. We don't have detransition data. We don't have empirical evidence because this is like lobotomy and experimental science, a get rich quick scheme for doctors and for progressive activists. But Chloe, people might say that detransition is rare. And like you just talked about, making a child go through the wrong puberty is so harmful for them. What's your response to that? Like Laura said, we don't actually know what the detransition or regret rates are. These doctors and these activists often cite these faulty studies that actually don't include those of us who decide to permanently transition or regret it or no longer identify as transgender. So they're not polling detransitioners. They're polling people who still identify as transgender, but have chosen to detransition um, for, for other reasons, not permanently. But there are recent, recent polls that have been conducted on those of us who have detransitioned. And some of these figures suggest as as many as up to 30% of patients end up changing their requests for hormones, um, the markers on in their files. But detransition is not recognized as a phenomenon by these hospital systems that do this to us. I didn't know that detransitioning was a thing until it happened to me, because it was never acknowledged to me in the forms for any of my treatments, by any of my psychologists, my physicians. I didn't know that there was an entire community of people like me out there. And that is incredibly important for us to address, because as it is right now, there is no treatment. There are no standards of care. There aren't even codes to bill for within the healthcare system. And that makes it difficult if you end up regretting this, if you want to stop transitioning, to live as your birth sex, knowing that the doctors who put you through this in the first place will not or cannot help you. And Laura, that's what I wanted to ask you about as well. A very common argument is it's doctors, it's psychiatrists that are saying that this gender affirming care is necessary. What's your response to that? Doctors are fallible human beings that have monetary incentives, um, to say the least. Additionally, what we see are a very small number of radical activists, particularly WPATH, as an activist pseudoscience organization of pedophiles um, and fetishists. They infiltrate the various institutions, HR, teachers, professors, medical boards, they infiltrate these organizations and through the lens of progressive tolerance on the coattails of the gay liberation movement, they manipulate well-intentioned but ignorant people into believing that this is the same as being gay or this is the same as a black civil rights cause. 
It's not. It's a fetish-based myth. And they infiltrate and they persuade the rest to go along with it through authoritarian, authoritarian control and manipulation. So you cannot trust most doctors to have their own informed opinion on this. They are blackmailed into not sharing their opinions. And if there's a whistleblower like me and Chloe or other or doctors, they are silenced in the media and in their bodies of work. So the counter argument to oh, we should trust doctors, is do you trust your own intuition as a parent to know that you shouldn't mutilate the genitals or stunt the puberty of your child? You need to have parental authority here because the doctors have sold out. And it is these doctors that are prescribing puberty blockers, right? We're told that they're reversible, Chloe, I think you know a little bit about this. What is a puberty blocker? Is it reversible? What does it do to your body? So a puberty blocker, um, in most cases they use the medication Lupron, is a medication that suppresses puberty through means of suppressing the communication between the gonads, ovaries in women um, and girls, or the, the testicles in, in men and boys. And it's not reversible. Not a single part of this treatment is reversible. I'm still suffering complications from every single part of this. From the blockers, from the hormones, from the surgery, of course, and even from the social transition itself. It's the premise that you can just block a natural bodily process without any consequences. The idea that you can just stop a child in time so that they can make a permanence in what is ultimately an adult decision governing their bodies. It's ridiculous. There is no basis in reality. And Laura, I know you've had experience with testosterone. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you went through with that? Testosterone was one of the worst drugs that I used to cope, and I used a lot of different drugs and a lot of different coping mechanisms to survive my trauma and my suicide ideation. It was one of the worst forms of self-harm, and it was administered medically and said that it was going to support my mental health. Instead, it permanently lowered my voice, took away my natural feminine voice. I permanently grow facial hair. It caused a mental breakdown at the time. I was aggressive. I was sexually promiscuous. I was getting into fights, stealing. I was doing all sorts of behaviors that I hadn't before because I was put on a high dose of this substance that was not meant for my body. Long term, if a woman stays on testosterone for about seven years, they will always need to get their uterus removed. They will need to have a hysterectomy because of the atrophy. And fortunately, I was doing so horribly from the testosterone that I went off because I couldn't live like that anymore. And thankfully, I still have intact reproductive system, but there are many women I know that don't have that. And that is egregious and evil. And I had a very similar experience on testosterone as well, especially with the behavioral and emotional um, difficulties. Um, I also started experiencing complications with my urinary tract about a year in because of the atrophy from from taking it. Um, I started, it got to the point that I was having UTI or UTI-like UTI -like symptoms um, almost every month to every other month. I was getting blood and clots of tissue in my urine. I don't know now if I'm going to be able to have children of my own. I have very irregular menses, and obviously I'm not going to be able to breastfeed children of my own. And because of the blockers, um, to this day, I'm years after stopping, I've, I'm experiencing joint pains to varying degrees. And while I was on it, it essentially put me into a state of a childhood onset menopause. I was 13 to 14 years old when I was experiencing symptoms like hot flashes, which would 
best be described as this uncomfortable, hot, itchy, tingling feeling just moving throughout my body. I was very lethargic. I couldn't focus on my studies. I was very emotionally numb. This is never and under any circumstance appropriate for children. It is ultimately a useless unnecessary physical treatment for a psycho psychiatric condition. What these children need, what these young men and women who are suffering from this condition need is compassion and love. They need real mental health care. And to love them doesn't mean to give them everything that they want. It's to focus on what they need. Even if that isn't in alignment with what it is that they want in the moment. And Chloe, I, I did want to jump in and ask you this too, right? Because we often hear that gender affirming care is health care and that it's rare for children to undergo transition surgery. I think you guys can both speak to this. We'll start with you, Chloe. I mean, whether it's rare or not, it's happening in the thousands and under no circumstances is it okay. I wouldn't call it healthcare. I wouldn't even call it medicine. It's the only form of medicine that has a 100% complication rate. It is iatrogenic treatment. Laura, in regards to gender affirming care being healthcare, what's your response? No. Uh. <laughs> no. <laughs> Gender affirming care, I call it elective gender modification, because what it is is an argument from the 70s and 80s when they were, when docs, when sexologists were studying basically fetishistic males that wanted to be females for sexual purposes. They denoted that there were some adults that preferred to live, present as the opposite sex. That is completely different from what's happening today where children are being taught by activists that there is such a thing as a gender identity, AKA a gender soul. This is a spiritual belief and a delusion that we're being taught to accept as normal. And we don't need to validate people's spiritual beliefs or certainly we don't need to act upon our parental authority or authority as a patient advocating for mental health treatment by accepting other people's forced religious or spiritual beliefs. If you start shifting your mindset from just a political issue to a spiritual philosophical issue, you understand that this is nowhere near mental health treatment. This is a desire for enlightenment. This is a desire to separate the soul from the flesh and to become a different person so that you don't have to suffer. That's not gonna happen. We're all gonna suffer. We all have bodies. And so, no, it's not medical care. So we have a lot of parents here today, specifically a lot of mamas. And I think many moms have thought about the question because of the culture that we're living in now. How do I respond if my child comes up to me and says, I think I'm transgender, Chloe? I think that's... Any parent, regardless of whether you're already dealing with this your, with your child or not, you should be empowering them with the truth. You should be talking about this with them from an early age, appropriate to whatever developmental stage that they're at, about the reality of this, to guard them against this ideology. Because whether you like it or not, they're going to learn about it through an outside source, whether it be if they're in public school, from the curriculum, from peers, from teachers, they'll discover it online, through their peer groups, and even through things such as like video game communities. It's everywhere. So you have to get to your child before, before outside sources do. And 
And if your child is already struggling with this, you absolutely have to challenge them. You have to talk it through with him or her. You have to ask, where are these feelings coming from? Where are you getting this idea that you can reject a fundamental part of yourself? And you should affirm not the identity that they've chosen for themselves. You don't refer, you should not refer to them by the preferred name or pronouns or identity because in doing so, you're giving credit to this idea that they can be born in the wrong body, that the way that they're made, that your womb made them, that God made them was wrong. And that is not true. No child deserves to believe that about themselves. So we should help them build their identity through other means. By affirming them in the loving way that God made them. And also through encouraging them to socialize, to build, to be involved as a part of the family, as a part of their community. And also to encourage them to build their own hobbies and skills because through that, they'll build a purpose and a real identity. It's also important not to focus too much on this. You shouldn't be spending all of your time with your child who is trans identified or gender dysphoric talking about it because you don't want them to think about this all the time. You want to be able to spend that quality time with them to just be themselves and to just bask and the love that you have for them. And Laura, I wanted to ask you too, what are some warning signs that maybe parents can look out for, or what do you think parents can do to protect their kids from this ideology? Like Chloe just said, you know, it seems like with the way society is, they are going to be introduced to it. What can parents do? Transgenderism, and this ideology isn't that different from any other type of social contagion or any other mental health issue that a kid might have. So first of all, don't think that it's just this unique thing that exists in a vacuum. The best thing you can do for your child is love them and be close to them. Understand that they are looking for boundaries. They are looking for how far can I push this? What is reality? What is good? What is bad? It's just like anything else. You need to develop a safe, loving place for your child to ask you questions, to feel like they can tell you things and not outsource that power to the internet, to their peers, or to any sort of doctor or uh, educator that comes in. I would suggest keeping your kids off the internet as much as possible. And being aware that if they do present with a non-binary or trans questioning identity, whatever their label is, make sure that you stay curious as you work through your own emotions about the situation privately. Come to your child after you work through that and say, tell me about this. I want to know about this. Be curious. Be open because that child is experiencing some form of confusion and some form of pain. The pain must be validated. The transgender identity should not be. And in our last minute here, what is the message that you guys would both give to a child who has maybe gone down this rabbit hole and fundamentally feels like, hey, maybe this isn't right? 15 seconds each. What is your message to potentially help that child? There is nothing wrong with the way that you're made. And the things that make you different are the things that make you unique. And they're all gifts. Everything that you have in your life is a gift that you should learn to cherish and grow with. My message would be, it's okay to be human. Part of being a human being is feeling all of these negative feelings, feeling negative in your body, mind, in your relationships as well as feeling love and moments of joy. So it's okay to be human. It doesn't mean that you need to change your body. Thank you both. You are both incredible.
so brave. And thank you so much to everybody who came to the panel today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.